still my friend and still a part of part of my life. I'm glad you guys are here. Those of you that are watching online, welcome again. Um, again, thank you, Pastor. Or, thank you, Elder Leroy, for sharing some of those follow up groups. And I do want to endorse them. And on the church website, if you go to Ferndale sdachurch.org, or just type in Ferndale Adventist Church, Google it, or DuckDuckGo, whatever you prefer, and uh, you can find it there, and uh, on the website, it'll have, I think it's under, if you click on the link across the top, Life Seminar 2022, you'll find all the follow-up small groups. Now, this here's, here's our remaining schedule. So um, tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we're going to talk about how to win with money, five ways to win with money. We're off on Thursday, but Friday is Freedom from Depression and Anxiety. That's at 7 p.m. And then Saturday is a big day. In fact, we've changed the schedule a little bit on Saturday, which will make it easier for you. So at, am I not on? Oh, it's not showing up. Oh, let me uh, fix that. Did it go off right away or was it not on at all? See, let me see this here. There it is. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, guys. I can't see behind me, so I'm glad you, you pointed that out. So Friday is freedom from depression and anxiety. And then Saturday at 10 a.m., learning to forgive and let go. I have met many people who struggle with depression because they have not learned how to forgive. And so forgiveness and mental health, they go together. And then at the normal church service hour at 11 a.m., I'm going to talk about how to have an emotionally healthy marriage. Then right after church, right across the little walkway there is going to be a fellowship lunch. So bring your appetite. We're having soup, salad, and bread. Not super heavy, but enough to make you feel full. And then instead of having the meeting at night, we're going to do it at 1 p.m. How's that sound? So once you're here, you're here. You don't have to go home and then come back. Um, I know for me it's nice because I live way down on the corner, and I think we've got a few other folks that might be commuting from a, a little distance. And so um, those of you watching online, please make sure you mark that down. We've updated the website as well. Um, but if we ever handed you, <clears throat> if you ever got like a printed schedule, um, obviously we weren't able to update that because it had already been printed. So tonight is on parent team. You know, you're not smart when you know something. You are smart when you do something. Remember, knowledge is not power. Knowledge is only potential power. I want to encourage all of you as you come out each night or to each of the presentations or your watch online to really apply these principles that you learn to your life. Now, I realize that a lot of information is given out, and so there's no way to remember everything. But what I would do is I would look for like one or two things each night that really stand out, that make sense, and try to apply that to your life. You know, this seminar, depending on where you're at in life, um, could potentially uh, change not only the trajectory of your life, but it could impact and change your family tree. You know, this life seminar is something that I had actually kicking around in my mind for a number of years. And then when COVID hit in 2020 and everything shut down, um, so much of my schedule involves public speaking. And with churches and places being closed, it was like, all right, what do I do? So I had to get creative <clears throat> with my time. And I thought, well, this is the perfect time. I've been wanting to put together a 10-part series. And so when COVID happened, we were all shut down. This is how I spent the first uh, couple of months of COVID was working on uh, reading books and putting together all of these different presentations. And so these principles that I share, although the principles work, again, I'm not perfect at it, but what I have done in applying the principles to my life is I can see how they've changed, how they've impacted my marriage, uh, my parenting, my finances, and of course, most importantly, my spiritual journey. And so having these principles in your life, apart from Christ, I don't think they'll work. So all of these principles we've learned are biblically, they are Bible-based. 
Now, on the previous night, we discussed the importance of decision making. In fact, I think that was, I think, the very first night. And, and, and we learned that what you value most in life will determine what kind of decisions you make. And one of your assignments was to write out your value list. And as I met with different folks and talked to different people, I found out that many of you, your value list was very similar to mine. It was God, and then maybe your spouse, your kids, extended family, and so on and so forth. And of course, knowing what you value most in life is important because it helps us make smart decisions. Now, if you got kids, somewhere on your value list, you're going to find your kids. Now, I joke that sometimes kids can fluctuate on the value list depending on how good they are, right? And, and uh, if they're actually listening to mom or dad. Well, tonight we're going to talk about parenting. You know, I heard the story of a guy who, although he had no kids, he thought, I'm going to write a book on parenting. He was going to call it the Ten Commandments of Parenting. You might have heard this story before. And then, of course, he had his first child, and he decided, uh, you know, after a couple of years of raising this, this, this wild child, this toddler of his, he was going to change the name of the book to Ten Suggestions <laughs> About Parenting. And then, of course, you know, his child became a teenager, and he changed the title once again to Ten Questions of Raising Kids. So it went from the Ten Commandments to the Ten Suggestions to Ten Questions on Raising Kids. You know, Mark Twain once said, when a child becomes a teenager, you should put him in a barrel, feed him through a hole in the lid. When they turn 16, Twain said what? Plug the hole, right? And uh, I've got a 14-year-old who's quickly going on 16. Now, when it comes to parenting, there is a lot of material out there that will tell you how to be the best parent. My goal in this lecture is to share with you some universal principles that will help you as a parent or a grandparent, because the ultimate goal of parenting is not to raise good kids, it's actually to raise future good adults. You know, it's been said, if you spoil your kids, you will raise your grandkids, but if you raise your kids, you will get to spoil your what? Is that a true statement, yes or no? It's a very true statement. Now, in this room here tonight, in this church, maybe online, not all of us had the privilege of growing up with, you know, good parents in a loving home. Unfortunately, not everybody gets to experience this, and there may be some here tonight, or maybe you're watching online, where sadly you grew up in an abusive home. You may not have grown up with parents, you know, or I should say, you may have grown up with parents that were addicts. Uh, maybe they were violent. Maybe there was a lot of anger. There was a broken home. And I just want to start off tonight by saying, if you grew up in a home like this, what you experienced was not your fault. Uh, you didn't deserve what happened to you. You know, none of us get to pick our parents, right? We're just kind of born into the family, born into the home we're born into, and that just kind of becomes our our reality, our lot in life. And so while we can't choose who our parents are, the good news is if you are a parent or thinking about becoming a parent, you can choose the kind of parent you're going to be. So remember that tonight. I couldn't pick my parents, but I can choose the kind of parent that I'm going to be. And again, some were raised in homes that could either leave deep wounds or others were raised in homes that left great memories. Now, if you're thinking about becoming a parent, or if you're currently a parent, know this. You can decide tonight what kind of parent you're going to be to your kids. Again, you didn't have the privilege of choosing your parents, but I want to emphasize that you can choose the kind of parent that you're going to be. And what I mean by that is you can break any cycle of violence, of of sexual abuse, of physical abuse, abuse, excuse me, of emotional abuse. You can break any cycle in your life and you can change your family tree. And ultimately, I want to preach and hope that's the goal of each and every parent when they have kids to say, I'm going to break whatever cycle I grew up with. I'm going to break that cycle for the sake of my own kids. I want to change my family tree. 
Now, I want to start off by sharing with you some of the things that will influence your child the most. Of course, the first thing is going to be God. God is going to have a great influence on your child. And those that can see their purpose in life tend to live happier lives. You know, for our children, that purpose must extend beyond themselves. Your child's life will always be restless, unsatisfied, and unfulfilled unless they have a living faith. In fact, Dr. Harold Cohen, a psychiatrist from Duke University, did a study titled Religion, Spirituality, and Health. And in this massive study, it revealed that people of faith have more meaning and more purpose in their life. People of faith have higher self-esteem. People of faith are less likely to commit suicide. People of faith had reduced anxiety, and they were less likely to engage in risky sexual behavior, and they had better cognitive functioning. Now, as parents, one of the best things that we can do for our kids is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Now, I have jo chosen Christianity because I find that Christianity offers the best explanation of what it means to be human. You see, our kids want what everybody wants. They want to experience the feelings of love and peace. The sad thing is they don't always know where to find it. And as a result, anxiety and depression are chief factors behind alcohol abuse, drug abuse, eating disorders, and sexual promiscuity. In fact, Christi uh, Christianity can help answer some of the most important questions in the minds of our kids. And so you're going to want to begin to fill some of these in here on page one. Here are three very important questions that need to be answered in the mind of every child, every grandchild, right? Question number one is, where did I come from? Now, kids, you know, or I should just say people in general, may not understand or have ever really thought this through, but the reality is there are three questions that everybody needs answered. Number one, again, is where did I come from? Number two, what am I doing here? What is life's purpose? And number three, where am I going? Right? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going? These are the three important questions that every young person needs to have answered. And the reality is, is Christianity not only gives the best explanation for these questions, but it can help comfort our kids when they do struggle with anxiety and depression. And notice that I said when they do, because life can be hard. And when those hard times come, Christianity offers a good foundation. And studies show that whether you're a person of faith or not, you know, you're still at some point in your life going to have some level of anxiety or some level of depression. And so being a part of a church and incorporating family worship are two very important um, habits, traditions, that parents need to get their church, or I'm sorry, their kids doing. In fact, notice up the very top of the second page, it says, what are two things that you can do to build a foundation of self-understanding and purpose in the life of your child? Those two things are being a part of church and incorporating prayer and family worship. So prayer and family worship are together, going to church and incorporating prayer and family worship. If you've got kids, no matter how old they are, make sure you take time to pray with them. Make sure you take time to incorporate some type of family worship. And when I'm talking about family worship, it doesn't have to be long, you know? It can be five minutes, 10 minutes a day. It can be, you know, prayer over dinner and, and discussion time about spiritual things. What I'm encouraging parents and grandparents to do is to take a proactive interest in their child's spiritual welfare because if we don't do that, someone else will, and most likely it's not going to be very good. Now, one of the encouraging things to share with you tonight is this. 
You don't have to be a perfect parent to be a good parent. In fact, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. If you're a parent or if you're someday going to become a parent um, or a grandparent, there are going to be times that you blow it. Now, as a parent, you get to watch your kids grow up. But have you ever considered that really your kids are also watching you grow up, right? <laughs> when you think about it, because, you know, when you're in your 20s or so, your early 30s, your child is born, you're not the same when they're a teenager and you're now in your 40s or maybe getting closer to age 50. So kids want to be, in fact, let me share with you a number of things that kids want. And so let me see here. Number C says, you do not have to be a perfect, uh, you don't have to be perfect to be a good parent. What are two crucial items kids crave? So number one is this one. Um, I think I, I put that out there. Let me check. Oh. Oh, yeah, here's two things that kids want. Number one is kids want you to be present with them. So that is the answer. Oh, yeah, it's highlighted blue. Ah, that should have told me. That was the rule. That's how I created my slides. So under C, number one is kids want you to be present with them. We call this being in the moment. Now, you can show this not by the quantity of time that you spend with your kids, but by the quality of time that you spend with them. So here's an example of what it means of being in the moment. Um, I've got young kids, and they're growing up, but my son still likes to go to the park. When my kids were younger, it was great. On a Saturday afternoon or after school on a nice day, we would take our kids to the park. In fact, down in Anacortes, we'd go to Stovic Park. It's a real big wooden park structure, just all kinds. I mean, for a kid, it's just, it's a great place, swings and all kinds of fun things to play on. And I would notice parents there at the park, as some parents would say to their kids, all right, go play, have fun. I'm going to be sitting here on the bench. And the parent would sit down on the bench and they would pull out their phone. They would be on their phone checking their social media or doing whatever while their kid was playing. They weren't engaging with them, you know? And, and I would see kids say, Mom, Dad, come here. I want to show you something. I'll be there in a minute. Just entertain yourself, you know? And, and, and kids want you to be there in the moment with them, to be present with them. And so I made it very—I made it—I I wanted my life to be very intentional where when I go to the park with my kids— I want to be there with them. You know? Now, I realize there's times they're going to have friends with them, and, and you're not going to be with them every time, but as best as possible, try to be in the moment. Try to be present with your kids. Now, number two under C is kids need to know what their parents believe about them. Kids need to know what their parents believe about them. Please listen carefully. Our kids want to know. Your kids want to know what does mom and dad think about me. And that's not just when they're young or a teenager, even into adulthood. They want to know what does mom and dad think about me. See, for example, when parents walk into the room and say you walk into the kitchen and your child's sitting there at the counter, this is a scenario that gets played out in many homes. You walk into the kitchen, your child's at the counter, you see them at the counter, but you don't acknowledge them. You're on the phone and you get something, then you leave. Then you go back to the kitchen later that day, your child say still at the counter doing something, and you go into the fridge, get a drink, walk out of the kitchen, and you don't acknowledge them. When you constantly walk into the same room as your child over and over and over again, and you don't acknowledge them, and when this scenario gets played out over and over again in your child's life, it sends the wrong message. You see, a child's identity is shaped by watching their parents for clues regarding what they believe about him or her. Parents, never forget what I'm about to tell you here. When you walk into a room where your kids are, within 15 seconds, your kids will be able to tell the kind of day that you have. See, kids watch those things. And so be very cognizant about that. When you walk into the room when your kids are there, acknowledge them. Acknowledge that they're there rather than just going in and out, in and out, being in the same house, but never acknowledging the child. So again, kids need to know what their parents believe about them. Now, knowing this, I decided that I would do something about it. So 
When I get home from work or from a meeting and I either pick up my kids at school or I co I'll come home from a meeting and my family's already at home and I park in the driveway, before my kids get in the car or before I walk up the steps to go into my house, no matter what kind of day I have had, I always pause and I take a deep breath and I remind myself, I say, Tyler, when you walk into this house or when your kids get into the car, what type of spirit or, or attitude are you going to convey? And, and so I do this all the time because, you know, I can have a rough day and I'm stressed out. I can get home and my wife and kids are happy to see me and I'm in a bad mood. And when I walk into the house and I'm in a bad mood, it can literally sour the entire evening in just a matter of 30 seconds. This is making sense, yes or no. You know, I can do that when my kids get into the car. I can be in, in a bad mood and say, quiet, I'm on the phone. You know, not that you guys have ever spoken to anybody that way, right? And then the whole ride home, there's just this, you know, tension in the car. So I am decided before I walk up the steps, I pause and I say, all right, check your attitude, Tyler. Before you walk into the house, what kind of spirit are you going to bring? Is this making sense, yes or no? Because I want my home to be filled with joy. And just because I've had a bad day doesn't mean I need to bring that home to my wife or to my kids. Now, when it comes to what we believe about our kids, please, please, don't just focus on their, you know, sports accomplishments, their grades, their talents, their academics. No, now please don't misunderstand me. These things are important. But a child's character is what's most important. I would rather my child be just mediocre at sports, be a B and C student that have high character, and excel in sports, be an A student, but be filled with pride and look down upon everybody. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Now, ultimately, I love my kid to excel in sports, be an A student, and still be humble, right? So it's not grades and accomplishments in sports. They're not bad, but make sure you're focusing on character because that's what's really important. Teach your kids things like patience, integrity, humility, faithfulness, kindness, compassion. And the best way to do this is to live it out and demonstrate it in front of them. It's to model this behavior for our kids. When it comes to parenting, this is D on your page. When it comes to parenting, more is caught than what? Taught. Remember that. More is caught than taught. Now, what if you're parenting a product prodigal child. I was what you would have considered a prodigal child. If you're parenting a prodigal child, never stop loving them. Never stop praying for them. And yes, we need rules. We need boundaries in the home. But our kids need to know that mom and dad love them no matter what. Hear what I said? Even if your child were to come out living a lifestyle that you don't agree with, child, and as a parent, they're looking to you, and you need to be unconditional in your love towards them, even if you disagree with how they're living their life. In fact, no matter the age, I would encourage you to text or call your child just, you know, periodically and just remind them how much you love them. Now, I know they may, you know, you may think, oh, they don't really know. They need that. Send them that text. Hey, I was thinking about you today. Just proud of what you're doing. I love you. I want you to know that. That speaks volumes to the heart of a child. If they're 30, 40, 50 years old, 60 years old, they're still your child. They still crave that affirmation from mom and dad. Something else you want to do, <clears throat> this is E, is know who your child's friends are and get to know their parents. Now, this and this would also be know who your grandkids, you know, friends are if you're the one 
that is very involved in their life. And this, of course, would also be, you know, age appropriate. If, if you're, you know, kids are in their 40s, you don't need to know who your kids, friends, parents are necessarily, you know. Um, so understand, take that in the context. But, you know, it's our job, parents, to teach our kids their values, all right? It's not their friend's job. It's not the public school. It's not the media. Teaching them values is our job, mom and dad. So let's lead them. Let's train them. Because if we don't, if we don't do that, the Bible says a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Right? It's our job to teach them. In fact, a well-known verse that's often quoted when it comes to raising kids is in Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When they're young, plant those seeds. Plant those spiritual seeds, because when they grow up, they may depart and leave church. That does happen, but you have planted those seeds in their mind. Keep praying for them. Keep loving them. And by lots of grace and prayer, we hope they end up coming back to God and the church. Now, as a parent, and I've met parents that they want their kids to grow up in a spiritual bubble as a way to protect them from any godless influence. You know, they'll say, we've got no TV, no internet, no movies, no music, and, and everything is no, 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 no. Now, the truth is, we can't protect our kids from everything. Now, when they're young, we set certain rules for them to follow. In fact, when the kids are young, you want to set rules and you want to teach your kids to follow rules. Now, a rule is what externally compels our kids to obey. But as our kids get older, parents should teach their kids to live by principle right? And a principal has an internal motivation to do what is right. So when they're very young, you teach them rules. You, 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 you teach them to follow the rules. But at some point, you have to teach them to live by principle. And I'll get into this a little bit deeper here in a few minutes. Now, one of the ways that you can accomplish this by, you know, teaching your kids to follow principles is by looking for teachable moments where you can demonstrate to them what it means to live a principled life. Remember, more is caught than taught. When your kids are young, always look for teachable moments, all right? Because they're watching you. You know, if you're tired, if you're you know, if your kids always watch you trying to shortchange people and cheat the system and you know, follow, you know, get right up on that line of being inhonest. And sometimes you tiptoe across it, sometimes you don't. And then you're trying to tell them to live a life and, 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 and to be honest, right? More is caught than taught. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy, and these words, this is Moses speaking, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and you, when you rise up. Moses is basically saying, look for teachable moments, right? Throughout their life, look for ways to demonstrate what it means to be a good, honest person. And so look everywhere. In fact, I have found some of the greatest spiritual moments uh, with kids happen when you're just out doing life. When you're just out doing life. For example... My son and I, one time we were at Fred Meyer's down in Burlington, and, and the cashier gave me some change back. <clears throat> she was in a hurry. I felt like the change she gave me was wrong, but she kind of handed it to me, and I grabbed it. We got groceries. As I'm walking out of the store, I'm still thinking about I'm doing the math in my mind. And I thought, the math is off. So I, I looked at that wad of cash that was folded up, and I began to count it, and I realized she gave me $10 too much. Now, is $10 going to cause Fred Myers to bankruptcy? Probably not, right? But I thought this is a teachable moment. Whether my kid was there or not, I would want to do it because I want to live by principle. I want to have integrity and to be honest. And so I said, Nathaniel, the cashier gave me $10 too much. What should we do? He was like four or five. 
his response was, we're rich, you know? <laughs> and which don't get discouraged when, you know, when a kid says that. I said, Nathaniel, now we live by principle. And in our family, we practice honesty. We're going to practice honesty. What should we do? So, I mean, I could have just gone back and given him the $10, but I thought this is a great opportunity. It's a teachable moment. So always look for those teachable moments where you can demonstrate what it means to live a principled life. Now, I want to talk a little bit about social media. In fact, um, this is F on your, on your uh, answer sheet there, F. It says, kids need affirmation. When it comes to social media, the longer you can keep your kids from being on social media, the better. The longer you can keep your kids from having a smartphone, the better. But at the same time, with your kids, you want to teach them how to be smart when it comes to using, not social media, but a smartphone. Now, in our home, our rule is our kids, until they're an adult, we're not going to let them have a social media account. We've had that conversation. We've had lots of conversations with my daughter because all of my friends are on Instagram, right? Or TikTok or Snapchat and uh, whatever they are, right? There's going to be a new one. Wait a couple of years and there'll be some new one that catches on. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, all of the studies when it comes to social media, all of the studies show that kids on social media <clears throat> have higher rates of depression, anxiety, poor body image, and loneliness. In fact, according to the report from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the suicide rate among people ages 10 to 24 between the years 2007 and 2017 went up 56%. It was right around this time when smartphones took off and when social media took off. Did you know that? Cutting has gone up by 30% in the lives of the young teenage girls are on social media because social media works against them. In fact, um, kids need affirmation. And if they're not getting the right affirmation from mom and dad, what happens is they go to social media because they want that affirmation. Studies show the number one reason kids are on social media is they want affirmation. As parents, we want our kids to have self, uh, I'm sorry, healthy self-esteem. But social media works against this because on social media, kids want to see, okay, how many clicks, right? How many views? My kids a few years ago started their own YouTube channel and I was monitoring it. I was helping them as they were making videos. My wife was helping them make videos because my wife does a lot of blogging and vlogging. And so helping the kids, because this is the world in which they're growing up, in, you know? And so do you build a bubble around them? Or do you say, we're going to go on this journey together? But you've got to be very intentional about it and never assume, oh, my kid's a good kid. I know they're in the bedroom, the door's closed, they've got their smartphone there, but I trust my kid. Absolutely not, right? <laughs> I don't care how good your kid is, absolutely not. But I noticed on, on, on YouTube, my kids on their channel, they were always checking to see how many views, how many views, how many views. You know, on Instagram, how many hearts am I getting? There's a reason why young girls, and I suppose young, go young boys, it's more prevalent in young girls, will post inappropriate pictures on social media. The reason they do that is they're, they're craving, they're looking for affirmation. And not just, you know, young girls or young boys, but I see it even among grown-ups will post pictures because they want people to say, look how gorgeous you are. You are so good looking. You are so beautiful. You are so handsome, or whatever it might be. What they're looking for is they want affirmation. And so social media does not offer the affirmation you want your kids to have. You know, the, uh, the, the CEOs and, and the founders of these big uh, tech companies, these social media companies, they don't allow their own kids to have these accounts. There's a documentary. I can't remember what it's called. It was on Netflix for a while. It's probably still on Netflix. 
but it dealt with this very thing. You could probably Google it and find out what it is that they don't allow their own kids to have the very social media platforms that they actually work for. Now, if you're a parent that thinks it's okay for your kids to have social media accounts, just know that you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire. Because what happens is they'll see pictures of some of their friends out doing something fun, and they'll wonder, why wasn't I invited? You know? You know, even grown-ups have a hard time, and we talked about this opening night, as we compare ourselves to other people, keeping up with the Joneses. It is much harder for kids. Now, for grown-ups, especially if you're married, if you have social media accounts, you have to make sure that your spouse has access. I'm not saying you have to go in there and snoop and spy on each other. I'm not encouraging that. There should be a level of trust, but there shouldn't be any secret among married couples, right? No secrets. Now, something else that we want to talk about here is engaged fathers. One of the best things for kids to have is a father that is engaged in their life. In fact, fathers are critical for helping their kids stay out of trouble. But what has happened in today's culture, and it started probably back in the 80s, maybe, I'm guessing is a lot of the sitcoms and TV shows, they begin to dumb down the dads. You go back far enough and some of the sitcoms and TV shows, the dads were the heroes. The dads were the ones at the end of the show would teach some kind of moral lesson, you know, and the dads had integrity and they loved their wives. And then came along, you know, uh, uh, Al Bundy <laughs> and, you know, Homer Simpson and the family guy and, and, and there's a dumbing down of dads in our world today. But you know, 80% of men that are incarcerated, they did a survey on this, 80% of men that are incarcerated, there was not an active father in their life. How dangerous is it today for Hollywood to dumb down dads, to portray dads, dads as being lazy or sex crazed or uninterested? You know, teenagers who have a father in the home are far less likely to struggle with depression, anxiety, and high-risk behavior like sex, drugs, and alcohol. Kids with fathers in the home are more emotionally stable, and they're more likely to finish high school and go on to graduate college. In fact, engaged fathers, which number is this right here? This is G, one of the best things for kids to have um, an engaged, a father engaged in their life. That would be G, have a father that is engaged in their life. You know, the culture in which the kids today are growing up in is a hyper-sexualized culture. We are living during an epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. This year alone, 20 million people will contract an STD. And even though the teenage population makes up a third of the population in America, teenagers will be responsible for contracting half of all infections. You know, back in the 1970s, if you grew up back in the 1960s and 1970s, there were just a handful of STDs. Um, today, there are more than 30 different STDs that affects kids who are sexually active. And kids these days are becoming sexually active younger and younger and younger. I mean, as young as 11, 12, 13. And most of the time, it's because there is not an engaged father in that home. Now, having a father connect with their kids will help prevent high-risk behavior. Now, I want to talk to the dads here for just a moment. And again, it doesn't matter how old your kids are, dads. I want to talk to the dads for just a moment. From the moment your child is born, they don't care what you look like. They don't care what kind of car you drive. They don't care how much money you make. They don't care the job you have. The child, your child looks at you and they see one thing, hero. I want you to know that. If you could see yourself through your child's eyes, your world would never be the same again. The way your child looks at you is dramatically different than the way, you're, than the way you see yourself. Fathers are heroes to their children. And so my question that I always want to ask dads is this. Are you willing, no matter what age your child is, are you willing to be a hero 
to your kids tonight. Here's something else that kids need. And this is H on your lesson guide. Kids need parents who are willing to make sacrifices. Remember, you couldn't pick your parents, but you can choose the kind of parent that you're going to be. And to make a sacrifice means that you're going to have to, at some point, you have to sit across the table from a teenager who is angry at you because you grounded them for bad grades or you took away their self. And it's easy for parents to fall into the trap of, I just want to be my child's friend. Remember, your kid's going to have a lot of friends through their life, but they're only going to have one mom and one dad. And I've had to experience this where my daughter got a C in math. Now, I tell my kids, as long as you're putting forth 100% effort, you know, if you get a B or you get a C, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, you know? As long as you are, and we can tell you're putting forth effort, which means if you get a paperback, you're correcting your answers, which means if there's study time or tutoring, we'll get you that. But as long as you're putting forth 100%, we're okay with that. Well, my daughter was not putting forth 100%. It was obvious, and she got a C in math, and we took away her, uh, her iPhone. You think she was happy? For an entire month, she had no phone. It was, if, it was literally as if I, like, cut off her right arm. And so some of you, maybe your kids are grown. You've never had to deal with this. Some of you are going to have to deal with it at some point in your life. Talking to you. <laughs> and, uh, but sitting across that table, telling my daughter, hand over your phone, seeing the look that she gave, you know, later that night, she was upset. She was hiding out in her room, no phone, pouting, upset. I brought her a little bit of a dessert. Walked into her room, and I said, Bella, I just want you to know that I love you. I want you to, I want to sit down. She said to me, you're in here because you feel guilty, aren't you? <laughs> I said, Bella, I don't feel guilty. I feel bad, but I don't feel guilty. And that's the challenging thing with parents is we want to be their friend and to have to sometimes be that person that does something that they don't like. That's not easy as a parent, but you have to think big picture. You have to be willing to make sacrifices, right? Kids need parents who are willing to make sacrifices. Again, Remember, kids are going to have a 1,000 friends in their life, but they're only going to have one mom, one dad. So make sure you're that mom and dad for them. Now, uh, let's keep going here. Um, in my home, for what it's worth, here's how we kind of lay out the rules and the punishment in my house, for what it's worth. In my home, we limit the rules to what is absolute necessary. And we use the least amount of force necessary to enforce those. Does that make sense? So we give the least amount of rules necessary to accomplish what we want to accomplish. And we use the least amount of force necessary to enforce them. And pretty much, I think that's a pretty good way when it comes to correcting and using kids. We don't want to have just a bunch of dumb, stupid rules just for the sake of having dumb rules. Kids need parents who will be spiritually strong for them. It's important to bring your kids to church. Get them involved in church. Very few things are as powerful in the mind of a child as having family worship. I talked about that a little bit ago. Kids need parents who are going to be in the moment with them. Put down the cell phone and engage with your kids. Make time for game night. We've got a whole closet full of games. This last year, my kids, like many kids, for whatever reason, this game been around for a while, but it really caught on. My kids love to play the game Catan. We play Ticket to Ride. And I am terrible at Ticket to Ride. My 14-year-old daughter beats me every single time. I'm thinking, how does she outsmart me with this, you know? <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, she beats dad. And so make plans to go bike riding, to go shopping together, eat together around the kitchen table. We eat dinner around our dining room table on average a minimum of five nights. 
we eat dinner as a family tonight. No phones are at the table. We talk, we engage. How was your day? What was the best thing that happened today? What was the worst thing that happened today? And uh, we all share our day and we talk together. Turn off the TV. If you're sitting in front of the, have you ever been to a restaurant and you see a family of four sitting around at a restaurant table and they're all staring at their own cell phone? Have you ever seen that before? I think, you know, and I see even grownups do that. I've been at business meetings with other pastors. We're all sitting there on our smartphones. And I say, all right, guys, everybody put your smartphone in the middle of the table, and the first one to grab their phone pays for the bill, right? Pays for the meals. So be in the moment. Kids need to know what their parents believe about them. Love your kids and be the number one affirmer in their life. Kids need parents to demonstrate what it means to live a principled life. Don't just focus on performance, but on their character. And the best way to teach a child to be patient, kind, compassionate, humble, and have integrity is to live it out in front of them. Remember, more is caught than what? Taught. More is caught than taught, right? Very important. Kids need to learn responsibility. Teaching kids how to say no and how to accept a no is a gift of enormous value. Teaching your kids how to say no and accept no is a gift of enormous value. I mean, all of us, we've all been around middle-aged adults that throw a tantrum when someone tries to set limits on them. You know what I'm talking about? Or they'll just simply go along with the crowd because they want to please other people. Why is this? is because as a child, they were never taught how to accept no or how to say no to that person. Children need to understand that the world does not revolve around them, and there's times when they need to hear no for an answer. In fact, Dr. Henry Cloud wrote a book called Boundaries. I think I might have mentioned it earlier. It's one of my favorite books. And in his book, he lists the order in which kids need to learn how to accept or follow a no. Here's the order. The first no kids need to learn from is the no from their parent. When mom and dad say no, no is a complete sentence, right? No. Number two, the no of siblings. Number three, the no of school teachers. Number four, the no of school friends. Number five, the no of bosses and supervisors. Number six, the no of spouses. Number seven, the no of health problems from overeating, alcoholism, or an irresponsible lifestyle. And finally, number eight, the no of police, courts, and even prison. In other words, if they have not learned no from their parents, from their siblings, from school, you go all the way down the list, eventually... They're going to hear a no, and it's going to be forced upon them, and they're going to end up incarcerated in jail. Does that make sense, yes or no? And so many times today, somebody is incarcerated, and we think, what happened to that person's life to get to this? Is because they never learned how to tell somebody no or how to accept a no. They have not learned how to create boundaries in their life. The goal of parenting is to help our children learn to accept a no early in life, hopefully in stage number one. If they learn it in stage number one, if kids learn how to say no and accept no, here's an example of that. I've got a teenage daughter. Someday she's going to go to Walla Walla College. It's a Christian school. Just because it's a Christian school doesn't mean everything that goes on there is always in the name of Jesus. There may be a time, in fact, I plan at some point in her life, there's going to be a time where someone says, hey, we're going to a party. If you want to come, they've got alcohol there. I want my daughter to have the conviction to be able to say, no, I don't want to go there. When she's on a date with a boy, hopefully she picks boys better than this, if he starts kind of moving in with a little bit of intent, I want her to have the conviction to be able to tell that boy no and not feel she just has to go along to make happy. 
So teaching our kids how to accept a no and how to say no is a gift of enormous value. How to set limits, very important. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 27, cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Kids need to learn the importance of boundaries. In fact, this means kids who learn how to delay gratification and understand the negative results of poor decision-making will be better prepared to take on the task of adulthood. In fact, one of the best things parents can teach their kids is how to delay gratification. How to delay gratification, saying, you know what, I know I really want to do this, but I've got something I've got to do that's important. I must do that first. For example, your child has a test on Monday. Instead of spending the weekend studying for that test, they decide, I'm going to play video games all weekend. Then Monday, they take the test, they fail the test, and guess what? They're now grounded from their video game system for a week, two weeks, a month, whatever the parent decides, whatever's going on, because that child did not learn how to delay gratification. So teaching your kids the gift of delaying gratification is an important gift. In fact, one of the best skills that parents can teach their kids is this skill we call, this is N, the delay of gratification. This is the ability to say no to one's impulses, wishes, and desires to have some gain down the road. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 15, it's a school of hard knocks. This is from the Message Bible, and I love this. It's a school of hard knocks for those who leave God's path, a dead-end street for those who hate God's rules. Is that true, yes or no? Let me put it this way. Never allow your child to get away with anything that would cause you to dislike them. All right? Never let your child get away with anything that would cause you to dislike them because If their actions cause you to dislike them, think what an effect they will have on other people who care much less about them than you do, right? Now, remember, you don't have to be a perfect parent to be a good parent. You are wired with everything you need inside of you. In fact, the Bible is filled with great instructions, and it helps our kids to be part of a community of believers. So these principles we went through tonight, if you apply these principles to your child's life, it will increase the chances that they will become well-mannered, God-fearing, productive members of society. In fact, my final advice to you would be this. Be very intentional about parenting. As a parent, especially as our kids get older, it's easy sometimes to get lazy. It's easy to fall into the trap and get lazy when it comes to parenting. Be sure that you're intentional and you're always in the moment with your kids. Remember, more is caught than taught. Teach them how to live a life of character by demonstrating that character in front of them. And finally, pray Pray and pray some more, right? (laughs) Pray, pray, and pray some more. Wednesday night, tomorrow night, five principles for winning with money. Friday night, freedom from depression and anxiety. Where does depression come from? How can we best treat it? Saturday morning, how to forgive and let go. And then Saturday at 11 a.m., how to have an emotionally healthy marriage. And after lunch... It's at 1 o'clock, not at 7 o'clock. 1 o'clock, how to stay healthy so that you can enjoy your life. Now, I want you to notice there is a homework assignment here on your page. And this, of course, you know, apply it depending on where you're at with your kids. But here's one thing all of us can do. Number one says, write your children or your child a personal letter where you share what you believe about them. And then number two is begin to apply the 1531 rule. Here's the 1531 rule. 
Spend 15 minutes every day face-to-face with your kids. You can do that if you eat dinner at the table together. Every day, shut off all the electronics in your home for at least 30 minutes and schedule one-on-one time with each child every week, right? So face-to-face conversation, shut off the electronics, and make sure you're spedu- spending quality time at least one day. You set up a date with your child. Doing this and practicing the principles in which I shared, you will have a great upper hand. Now, here's some questions that are up on the screen here. And um, I'm going to have the closing prayer. And if you want to spend a few minutes talking with those around you, you can, depending on where your kids are at. Um, You may want to spend time, or if you feel like you kind of got this down and maybe your kids are grown and out of the house, um, you're welcome to maybe share, or you're welcome after I pray to go ahead and leave. There are some refreshments out there, so please be sure to grab something on. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we just want to thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity we have, Lord. You know, as a parent, it is not only the most, well, challenging but it's the most rewarding job that anybody will ever have. And Lord, you know, as our Heavenly Father, we want to demonstrate to our kids um, the relationship we have with you, knowing that when our kids are young, when they look at us, often, you know, they'll see you reflected in us. And so, Father, I want to pray for all of the parents here. I want to pray for all of their kids, no matter what the age is, whether they're three years old, whether they're 60 years old, or whatever age their grandkids are. Father, we pray for these kids, for those in the church, but especially those out of the church. We want them to come back and have a committed relationship with you. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful evening, and we will see you tomorrow, 7 p.m.